So we see and we understand that the fifth seal is open and there's persecution that begins against the, the Christian church. Persecution from the Roman Empire and from other sources. And this persecution is something that is going on and it's the, the, the part of the going through the fire, the testing of the fire that the church is going through. And we also have to remember that the church itself is an entity. <clears throat> we also have to remember that it's not just called the fifth seal. Because Jesus named this period of time also. And he called the period of time the time of the Gentiles. Let's take a look at that scripture. Luke 21 and 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. I'm going to read that again. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. Okay, we know that's the destruction of Jerusalem, 70 A.D. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now I want to discuss something dealing with the word Gentile. There's been a lot of teachings that have been going out saying that in the New Testament, Jesus was only sent to the Jews and the Israelites, the lost sheep of Israel. And we have, we've gone through that in the earlier videos and shown that's incorrect, that the, the people that are teaching that don't have a right understanding of Scripture. But even after they teach that, and then we bring up that the Gentiles were the next people, that was the next wave of people coming into the church, some of these same people want to say that, oh, these Gentiles were not actually of the other nations. They were people of Israel that weren't practicing what we call today Judaism. And this also is false. What you have to understand about the word Gentile, first of all, is the word Gentile is utilized in the Bible before Moses, before Jacob, before Isaac, before Abraham, before any of the Jewish forefathers, they utilized the word Gentiles. The first time it was utilized is actually in Genesis. It was utilized in Genesis. And the term means nations. It was speaking of the nations. So understand that Moses is dictating the, the book. He's writing the book. Okay? And the angels are telling him everything that happened from the um, beginning up until that time. Okay? And the angels are telling him the, the nations. The nations. In Genesis 10 and 5. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families, and in their nations. And then it goes on talking about Ham and Cush and Mizoram and Punt. These are literally Egypt and Libya, and then it talks about the, um, the Canaanites. So this is long before Israel ever existed. That they were calling these people Gentiles, these foreigners Gentiles. And then in the New Testament, where the mistake is being made is that there's a place in the New Testament where they call they use it, they translate the word into Gentiles that actually means the Greeks. It's the word for the Greeks that's translated Gentiles. But here, in 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 where Jesus is using it, and he's talking about the times of the Gentiles. Jesus uses the word ethnos. And the word ethnos means a foreign people or the, the heathens, the nations. That's the term that he used. And when you look up the word, by implication, it means the pagans. 
And the key thing to understanding that Jesus is not talking about no lost people of Israel is that Jesus said they're going to trod down Jerusalem. Now remember, this is why it's so important that you have to understand the history of what took place. A lot of people are trying to teach the Bible, but they have no understanding of the history of what took place. And because of that, they are misunderstanding terms and misunderstanding things that the Bible is saying. Jesus said, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to get back to the scripture. One sec. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. He stated the word Gentiles twice, but he uses the same word, ethos. And it means foreigner. And we know the original people that came in and treaded down Jerusalem was the Romans during the war. And the Romans are not of the lost sheep of Israel. And there was no nation that controlled um, Jerusalem after the, the destruction, uh, the abomination of desolation, the destruction of 70 AD. There was no group that controlled Jerusalem that can be considered the lost tribe of Israel. Because the lost tribe of Israel never started another nation. They never started another nation. And I know some people saying, well, they're there now because of 1948 and the Zionist movement, but there's a lot more to say about that. And if you want to be honest about um, the, um, the, the origins of people, then there's a lot of discrepancies there. And we're going to go over videos dealing with that in the future, but just not at this time. But Jesus identified that these were foreign nations that he were calling Gentiles. And the times of the Gentiles. And what's so funny about it, the word that he utilized and he said times of the Gentiles. That word times, it means not just a season or a period of time, it means opportunity. So he was saying it was the season of the Gentiles or the opportunity of the Gentiles. The opportunity to what? The opportunity to come into right relationship with the Father through his Son. They had received the opportunity that was originally given to who? That was given to Israel. And that's why um, Paul talks about being grafted in. That Christians are being grafted into Israel. Because we're being grafted into their opportunity. So when people try to teach that, oh, this is not talking about the foreign nations, this is talking about the lost tribe of Israel, no way, no how. I'll debate anybody on that anytime, any place. It is not. These are the foreign nations. These are the Gentiles. And Jesus is trying to say, it's your time now. And, and if you look at the, 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 one of the best explanations of it is the, the wedding feast. When you look at um, the parable of the wedding feast, where the master says, go into the highways and byways and get the good and the bad and bring them into the wedding. And he said what? He said, go those that were invited that wouldn't come. He said, go and burn up their city. And that's why I always ask them, go and read that. I think it's Matthew 22. When people want to dispute that this is not talking about the Gentiles, that the Gentiles were never accepted by God, I tell them to go read the, 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 uh, Matthew 22. Go read the wedding fest. Okay? Listen to this. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parable and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared a dinner, my oxen, and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their way, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants, and entreated them spitefully, and slew them. And when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and sent forth his armies, and destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. What city do you think that is? Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, as many as ye shall find bid to the marriage. 
So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into utter darkness, and they shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Israel was the initial ones that were invited, and it wasn't just the Jews. It was all the tribes. That's why Jesus told the disciples initially not to go to the what? To, the, to anyone other than the lost sheep of Israel. The lost sheep was all those that were lost. Lost in doctrine. Lost out of the area, out of the nation. Go to them. And that's why it was so important, you know, even on the day of Pentecost, that the, with the speaking of tongues and all the different languages, those Jews that were living in different places heard the gospel in their own language, their, their new language that they had attained by wherever they lived. And they went back all over the world and spread it, spread it. And it was three and a half years that was still left. But they still did not come. And then he said, go into the highways and the byways and get the good and the bad. And he didn't mean that literally bad people. He said, go and get those that some people see as good and some people see as bad. Whoever will accept the gospel, go and get them. But you got to come in with that wedding garment. And that wedding garment is the garment of righteousness spoken about in Revelations. Got to have it on. When Jesus said to the church of Laodicea, at least you walk naked. Because walking naked means you don't have on the garment. And that's the garment that Christ gives to all those that come into the body of Christ. And we are told to even keep it clean. So salvation went out to everybody. Okay? Peter sent to Cornelius. Paul struck down. Saul struck down. His name changed to Paul. And he sent to the Gentiles. So all of these people are coming into the church, are coming to the church, are coming to the church, and the persecutions are growing. And this is something that is not common knowledge. Greece, Greece had taken over that area. People don't understand that before the Romans, it was a Grecian empire. The Grecian empire lasted for hundreds of years. Okay? And they had taken over that area, and then the Roman empire came in after. People always ask, why is it that there's not a Bible that was written in original Hebrew. It could not have been written in original Greek because the, all these people that are talking about in the gospel, and let's talk about the New Testament. I'm sorry, the New Testament. Why the New Testament wasn't written in, originally in Hebrew. Okay? Let me ask you a question. You're living in America. Why aren't we writing in Blackfoot? Why aren't we writing in Cherokee? Why aren't we writing in Comanche? You see the, the difference that has taken place between 1776 and now? You see the changes that are happening in this country? You talk about less than 300 years. Less than 300 years. And if you would have came in the early 1700s, everybody would have been speaking English, Indian languages and any writing would have been taking place would have been Indian writing. Yet 300 years later, total change because those people were conquered. Well, the Grecians came in and conquered those areas. And they forced everybody to do the same thing that happened with the English forcing everybody to start speaking English and writing English to why right now, if you go to most Indian reservations in America, they all speak English. They all write English. So the same thing happened in Judea when the Grecians came in. Initially, the people that came back from Babylon, they spoke the Babylonian language and they wrote on Babylonian script. But when the Grecians conquered and they changed everything, everybody was writing in Grecians. That's why the New Testament is in Greek. And people are talking about, well, it should be in Hebrew. No, it should not be in Hebrew. Because the Grecians controlled that area. 
Hellenistic Jews. They talk about these were the Jews that literally lived in the culture of, 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 of the Grecians. And then the Romans came in, but the Romans came out of the Grecian Empire. And then developed the Roman Empire. So they spoke Greek too. They wrote in Greek too, even though they still had their Roman language. So in the same way you can look at America and you see nobody is writing or speaking these Indian languages and it's been less than 300 years. You look into that area with the Grecians and the Roman Empire and you're talking about like 500 years of domination. And that's why those people wrote the gospel in Greek. And the writing, most of the writing that was taking place was in Greek. Were people still writing Hebrew? Yeah, they still had a language in the temple. But remember, remember, in 70 AD, the temple and the priests and the scribes were all killed. Because they ran into Jerusalem and not out of Jerusalem, they died. So it was very few people writing Hebrew, the common language. They was writing the language according to where they lived. But the language of commerce was Greece. It was Greek, the Greek language. And that's why we have the Bible that's written in Greek. The New Testament that's written in Greek. So it's the time of the Gentiles. The opportunity for the Gentiles to come in. The wedding fest um, in Matthew 22 gives us exactly what's going on in the parable. And uh, you know what's so funny about it? I ask a lot of people that, that say they're either Jewish or they're Israelites. And I say, have you read that parable? Give me the understanding of it. And they don't even want to they don't even want to deal with that parable because it exposes a lot of things. So, this is the time of tribulation that has taken place. The church is going to be literally persecuted. And this is, what a lot of, this, is, this is something else that a lot of people don't understand. The initial persecution that started with the Christian church, it lasted for almost 300 years. When people tell me, how can you say you're a Christian? That's a religion created by the Roman Empire. I look at them and inside I'm kind of laughing. But I don't want to be disparaging to anyone. Most of the time. But I understand the truth that the Roman Empire were killing Christians for 300 years. I want you to think about that in your mind. They were killing Christians for almost 300 years. They were murdering, persecuting them. In all the, the lands that they controlled, their empire, they were killing them. And they kept growing. And that's what they couldn't understand. They kept growing. So they're murdering these Christians. They're murdering these Christians. You know, it's, it's almost 300 years and they're murdering these Christians. And then all of a sudden, in Africa, Christianity is growing so strong that the... Exum Empire accepts Christianity. The New Testament is put together in 325, around 325 AD. All the books are put together to make the New Testament. It's canonized in Africa. A lot of people don't know that. And that's for the foolish people that are speaking that um, Christianity was brought to Africa by the colonizers in the 1500s. Yeah. Think about it. 1,200 years before that, 1,200 years before that, the New Testament was canonized in Africa. Look it up. And the priest that was overseeing it, I'm going to put his picture up here. I, I, I think I did it in one of the other videos. It's St. Augustine of Hippo. Hippo is the city in Africa where he presided. And he says, he says, he, no, no one else, I know they have whitewashed him and made him into a white person today. And he, if you look up at the modern pictures of him, he looks white. But when you go to his journals and he says, I am an African, broad nose and all, from Africa. Then you realize what's really going on. But he's the one that approved the canonization of the New Testament. And at that time, at that time... Christians were still being persecuted. 
they were still being persecuted. So the Exum Empire, the Exum Empire was one of the first, I believe they were the first. Some people say it was the Armenians, but I believe it was the Exum Empire, was the first nation to accept Christianity as a state religion. They were an African empire, and they drove the Romans out of Africa. And then right after that, the Egyptians accepted Christianity as the state religion. So you had an Exum Empire in Africa, which is located around Ethiopia and where Kush was, and even into Yemen area, they controlled all of that area. They drive the Romans out. That's how powerful a nation they are to drive the Romans out of Africa. They are Christians. They free Egypt from Roman control. Egypt becomes a Christian nation. And they, they, they have Christianity in Africa hundreds of years before Islam is even founded. Africa is Christian. Those areas of Africa are Christian. And it spread through Africa. It wasn't just those areas. That's why you hear people in Uganda that are saying their, their ancestors, 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 ancestors knew the Bible, knew all the stories about Jesus and Adam and all these different things. And people don't want to believe it because they believe that 1,500 years later that some British man on a, on a, on a sailboat came into Africa and brought a Bible in and that's where people learned Christianity. And the Africans of that live in those areas will laugh at you. More than a thousand years before they knew about Christianity. But so the persecution is going on. But as the Roman Empire is persecuting these Christians, a funny thing is happening. The more they kill, the more they murder, the more they send into the Colosseums and the gymnasiums, the more they, they, they slay and throw before beasts, Christianity continues to spread because God is doing his work. It continues spreading. So all of a sudden, there's a Roman emperor named Constantine. And Constantine did not accept Christianity until his deathbed. But if you read the history, they, t they want to tell you that he accepted it because he went up on a hill before a great battle and he looked up at the sun and in the sun he saw an image of a cross. And he said that if he won the battle, he would serve the God of that image. And he won the battle. So they say he became a Christian. There's only one problem. The cross that he saw ain't the what you think. It's not what you think it is. I remember when I was doing my studies at the university and I was, you know, talking to different people and I would read different scholars and talk about that cross that Constantine saw. And there were always different opinions of how it looked. And some people, and they would say things like, it might have been the Christian cross, or it might have been close to the Christian cross. But then I found out that Constantine told all of his soldiers to put the cross on their shield. This is the cross. Does that look anything like a Christian cross? That is the Catholic Chiro symbol. And if you do your research, that goes back to Osiris. That's the symbol for Osiris. And then when you realize that Constantine, through his life, when he said he was a Christian, it was not the truth. He was putting up all of these temples to Zeus and to Jupiter and all of these foreign gods and even gods of Egypt. And it wasn't until his deathbed that he begged them to come because of fear. He begged them to come and baptize him as a Christian because his life he did not live as a Christian. That is all a false narrative. He was never a Christian. So Constantine is not the one that a lot of people like to say, well, Constantine came in and started the um, Catholic Church. And, and no, he, was not, he wasn't Christian. So if he started the Catholic Church, then they're not Christian either because he wasn't Christian. He was worshiping all of these pagan things, pagan traditions. And this will actually explain how a lot of these traditions got into the Catholic Church. So Constantine, he's going about and he stops the persecution. This is what he did. Because what, what his mindset was is that he accepted all religions. 
So he stopped the persecution. I'll give him credit for that. He stopped the persecutions against the Christians and allowed the Christian church to grow. But the church that was growing was a church that was being led by we Christians. Remember, the Romans had systematically eliminated those that had the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's why after around 200 A.D., you don't hear anything more in the writing of the church of people speaking in tongues. It's in the Bible, but then it just disappeared. Because those are the ones that had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Those are the ones that were obeying God and they were being killed. Because guess what? According to scripture, you will not receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit until you decide to obey God. That's one of the reasons so many Christians today cannot receive it. Because so many teachings in the church is that you don't have to obey God and make it in. You can keep sinning and still make it in because you can't lose your salvation. But you can't receive the Holy Spirit unless you obey God. You don't believe me? Let's take a look. Turn to Acts 5.32. Acts 5 and 32. I'm going to start with 31. He had God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost whom God hath given to them that obey him. I remember telling a young Christian that the Holy Spirit is going to start telling you little simple things to do. Little simple things. Not even major things. Just little simple things. Because he's going to prove your heart to yourself. Not to him. He already knows your heart. But he's going to prove it to yourself. <clears throat> and if you say that you love God. And you love Christ. You're going to want to obey everything that the Holy Spirit tells you. And this is something that I went through. Where the Holy Spirit told me to do something. I said I wasn't going to do it. <clears throat> yeah. And I went through seven years of hell and high water. Because I refused to do what I was told to do. I went through a lot of issues. One day I'll give my testimony on that. But you will not receive the Holy Spirit until you, until you decide in your heart to obey Him. So when people are saying that any, when you confess you receive the Holy Spirit, that is a lie. You, you'll know when you receive the Holy Spirit. It's power. It's power beyond anything that we can imagine. And you know it, you feel it. But if you have not made up your mind that you're willing to obey him, you're not going to receive him. Because some of us are living in lifestyles we don't want to give up. People we don't want to give up. Habits we don't want to give up. And when the Holy Spirit comes and says, and it's going to be simple things, it's going to be easy things, but he's showing you your heart. And you're going to be like, well, I can't do that. You cannot read the, receive the Holy Spirit until God knows that you're willing to obey Him. Now, it doesn't change the fact, and it doesn't mean that you're not going to sin after that, but it means that you're willing to obey. When you start going through the fire and the struggles and the attacks by the enemy and demon, yeah, it's times are going to come up as you're going to sin. But your sinning gets less and less as you grow spiritually. But you have to have a heart to obey. And the doctrine that they're teaching today is, is transforming people's heart, making it it's susceptible to disobedience because you think you can get away with stuff and you don't have to obey. And I'm going to show you one more scripture that's going to shock you. Turn to Hebrews 5 and 9. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. There's no open spiritual growth without obedience. There's no Holy Spirit <clears throat> without that initial obedience. And our walk is in obedience to salvation. The unto. From our confession unto righteousness, 
You walk that pathway by obedience. And that's what we're learning. That's what we're growing in, in that process of obedience. We're learning good and evil. There's a scripture where it talks about Christ learned good and evil, but what they're really saying is that we are the ones. He, he went after, he didn't have to learn it. He went through it because we have to go through it, but we're the one that have to learn it. We're the one that have to learn it. So the fifth seal, it's a tribulation period. It's a testing of the church. And it's almost like the, 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 the period of time that we go through when we're going through our persecution and our suffering until we come to the point that we're, we're willing totally to follow God. We go through a type of period like that. But the church was going through it. And there was a lot of testing and there was a lot of struggling and there was a lot of fighting. There was a lot of killing going on. And they were being persecuted. And then Constantine saw that vision. He stopped the persecution on the church. But then the Catholic Church, through Constantine, the Catholic Church was developed and Catholicism, and they took control of Western Christianity while the Greeks had a, the Eastern um, Greek church was, was control of the Eastern um, Christianity, and then you still had different African sects in Africa that were Christians that were holding on. But then the Catholic Church started their own persecution that everybody that wouldn't accept the way they were doing things. And their way was false because initially it, they came out and said our traditions is equal to the scripture. And anyone that says that, they're, they're fallen. Your traditions is not equal scripture. So that's how they kept all of those pagan traditions in that form of Christianity, which is not the biblical form of Christianity. And that's how they started worshiping Mary and worshiping images and all these different things that are caught up that we, it's not, we don't have time to go through in this video. And this is the time of the Gentiles. This is the opportunity for the Gentiles to come in and become Christian. This is a time where the, 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 the world is being saturated with Christianity. But this is also the time of the falling away. Because the true Christianity, the true biblical Christianity, a lot of it is not being adopted. And this is why Christ said a lot of false prophets and false um, um, Christ were going to pop up all over the place. And it was happening back in them days. Not just now. It's not just for the end of time. It started back in those days. And it's the time of the Gentiles. And this is a long period of time because this has actually came up to present day. People always ask me, what seal are we in? And I say, we're either in the end of the fifth or in the beginning of the sixth. And when I mean beginning of the sixth, it means that sixth seal is about to be open. And when that sixth seal opens, whoo, Lord help. This world, Lord help earth, because all hell is about to be poured out. Because it's the time that Christ is coming back for the church. It's in the sixth seal. And when you line up the sixth seal with what we're going to talk about dealing with Christ, you're going to know, when because Christ is going to state everything that happens in the sixth seal. So we know that's the time that he's coming back to take the church. That's when he said, look up because your redemption draws nigh. It's the time. And it is pre-tribulation. We're not going through the tribulation. People keep saying that, you know, we're going to go through the first three years or, you know, we're going to go through the whole thing. No. Because the tribulation period is in actuality is when God pours out his wrath. The revelation tribulation is when God pours out his wrath upon the earth. And during that period of time, we are not going to be here. There's so many scriptures that say that, going back to even the book of Job. And when we get into the sixth seal, we'll discuss that. Saints, I hope you're getting a better understanding of, of what's going on through the first and the fifth seal. I haven't decided yet, but I might put up a little hold before I go into the sixth seal because I want to talk about some things dealing with spiritual warfare. I want to start getting in some of those things, especially in this month where so much wickedness is going to be released as we get closer to the devil's holiday. And I want to discuss some, some specific things dealing with that. So I might try to do them both together or I might just hold up on the 6th 
and just go straight into the spiritual um, warfare. Haven't decided yet, pray with me, um, even as I pray and see if God will give me leeway or, or, or what he wants me to do concerning that. I hope the first five seals have given you a better understanding of what has taken place and it's opened up your understanding to what's going to, what's, what we're heading to in the future. Okay, understanding the past gives you a better ability to understand the future. I hope this has been a blessing to you and um, it was a fight, especially with this fifth seal. And I don't think it was a fight because of the fifth seal itself. I think is some forces out there that don't want me to go into the spiritual warfare because it's going to reveal a whole bunch of things and it's going to expose a whole bunch of things. But going forward, I'm going to finish the sixth seal and I'm going to hopefully be doing the spiritual warfare and the sixth seal um, together so I can put out, if I have to do more than one video for the um, sixth seal, I can put out maybe two or three videos on spiritual warfare around the same time and, and, and just piggyback them together until we're completed with the sixth seal and then I'll continue with the spiritual warfare or any other thing that pops up. So guys, keep me in prayer. There's a lot of uh, attacks going on. Um, when you see that I haven't put out a video for a while, normally there's something going on. So keep me up in prayer because this is a process we're trying to grow the channel. Guys, please, please share the, the channel. So many people have asked me, they have watched some of the videos and it's like, how some of this stuff haven't like gone viral? The Christians should be eating this up. And I'm like, it's a fight. It's a, it's a fight, spiritual fight going out there that anytime you're putting out the things of God, they're going to try to suppress you and then they're going to try to attack you uh, with oppression, depression, everything that they can to try to hold you back from putting these things out. And I've literally sat and watched my videos on my analytics and seen videos disappearing or views where I'll see, let's say, there's 192 views and then all of a sudden it's down to 190. And I was like, okay, how can that happen? And then their views would pop up on my analytics. They show little bars. And then I'll see negative views. You can, there's no such thing as a negative view. You can't unview something. But negative views would come up and, they, and, and views will disappear. I've seen this. And I understand this is a fight. I knew this was going to happen from the beginning. You know, I was prepped to spiritual warfare when concerning um, the internet and, and the web and spreading the word of God. But we're going to push through it and... This channel is going to continue to grow. Please like, share. If you, if you see a video and it touch your heart, like the video. The more YouTube is going to share the videos and others are going to get to see it. So please like, subscribe. Um, let's grow this channel. It's positive and like I said, nothing is being asked of you. You're not required anything. It's a place where you can come and you can sit back and you can hear teaching. You know, not everybody's going to agree with everything that I say. I told you all that from one of the earlier videos. That is some things that I was told initially that no one could have told me that it was the truth. I wouldn't have accepted it. Especially before I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But then when God starts opening up your eyes and showing you things, and you realize, oh my God, what that person said was correct. It sounded crazy at the time, but it was actually correct. I know a lot of people get upset when I speak about the situation with Christmas. Hey, I didn't want to accept it either. I had to go and research and I told the person I'm going to show them that they were wrong and ended up, came back and I had to put my head down. So a lot of times there are things that we're going to disagree on. You know, take what you, take, take, take the things that you know are a blessing to you, the things that you disagree on, pray on it. Ask God to open up your eyes if something that you're seeing is different, open up your eyes to the truth. And you can share whatever with me, but come with scripture. Because if you know when I answer your posts and y'all ask me questions dealing with specific things, if you see me get into a long post, I'm going to put a lot of scriptures. Those in the Bible study group on Facebook, you know I utilize scripture to support everything I say. And I don't go by man, I go by what the Bible says. Okay? So, y'all be blessed. Look for another video coming soon. And always remember, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee, and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee, and give thee peace.